In this episode, our guest is Alex Safe Cummings. Alex Safe Cummings is a historian of law, technology, labor, public policy in American cities. She's a leading voice on pop culture and public history, and she has published on a variety of topics, from music history to the information economy. Her teaching focuses on the history of media industries, such as music publishing and broadcasting, and on American legal and political institutions such as copyright. So that makes her a, an ideal guest for an ideal guest for this uh, World Culture podcast, I think. So welcome, Alex. Very nice to have you here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. So um, you've written about how music piracy is almost as old as the existence of sound recording. Um, well, in fact, sound recordings in the US, at least, have long not been protected by any form of copyright. And people have been bootlegging, sampling and stolen music um, ever since, the, I think, like the late 19th century. Um, can you briefly guide us through this fascinating history? I didn't know about this, so I was really I was very excited by, by your writings on this. Well, yeah, I mean, this is um, this is kind of like a classic case of I'm an academic, which means I'm an incredibly stupid person. Um, but like I was in grad school and I was trying to do a dissertation and it I wanted to write about like the like the history of the compact cassette, because I thought that the beginning of piracy and bootlegging had to have been in the 1960s when magnetic recording, when uh, cassettes, four tracks, so forth, uh, became widely available. Like a lot of history dissertations, uh, this went way further back than than one would have expected. And I found all these examples of people bootlegging or pirating music in the 1930s or uh, 1910s, 1890s, and in the era of the piano roll like the, the mechanical piano um, in the era of the wax cylinder uh, or the shellac record. When you would think, how, how, how in the hell were people like bootlegging shit back then? Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting. That's weird. And because of that, I came across this fact that sound recordings in the United States were not actually copyrighted until 1972, which is just so weird. And I mean, it's much later than almost like most, like most other like countries, certainly most like industrial, quote unquote, industrialized or like advanced countries. Um, and I thought like, why is, why, why would that have been the case? And so that really became the organizing sort of, um, question around the book that I wrote, um, D D Democracy of Sound, um, which was really like, what happened with this history of like property rights and sound recordings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's especially fascinating as well, because like you say, the music, like you say in your book, um, which is published in, uh, I think, Oxford University Press and has appeared in 2013. I think we will share the link to it in, uh, in the notes by this blog. Um, and you actually trace, or you actually state that, you know, like the music industry has, has traditionally been actually one of the yeah, forerunners in, in copyright legislation, enforcing copyright legislation. Uh, and you actually claim in this book that by fighting music piracy which they the music industry really started in the doing in the 60s um so even before actually the sound recording uh, sound recordings were, were uh, would fall on copyright law they really um expound or were, were quite essential in expanding the scope and the strength of american copyright law um could you explain us a bit more about that what happened there and and maybe more interestingly why did it happen and what are the effects on the music industry at the day and and i think these effects still still play now in uh, 2021 i would say that it's it's it seems very weird and i should like explain how this happened um the the music industry is both like late to the party and early to the party as far as like advancing intellectual property rights. So you have this very weird situation that comes out of basically like 1905, 1908, where you have these new technologies like um, wax cylinders, um, like records, uh, piano rolls, stuff like that. 
And there's this big question of like, well, okay, who owns that? Like, is it the songwriter who wrote the song? Is it the uh, singer or musician who sang or played the music on that? Is it the record label? Is this sound engineer in the studio? Like, who owns that recorded sound? And this was a very confusing um, question for um, lawmakers, for policymakers, for just judges, anybody who was involved in trying to litigate these conflicts, because there were conflicts between what were called then the talking machine companies, uh, mm -hmm. talking machine. So the, basically the record industry of that time and the songwriters uh, who had who had rights like in terms of the written composition of the song the sheet music basically they had had rights since the 1830s in the united states but there was no no actual copyright for the actual recording like me singing um like a prayer by madonna versus you singing like a prayer by madonna which would be much better than me but those would be two separate works of art, right? Um, but they're the same song. So it was very hard for um, policymakers to sort of figure out how, who, like, who owns that? Who owns sound? And it, they basically, like what Congress in the United States does most of the time, is to just punt the issue. Just be like, I, I don't know, we'll deal with this later. So basically they created a whole complicated system about how songwriters would be comp compensated for the use of their songs in sound recordings. But as far as like the actual sound recording itself, like actual performance of Frank Sinatra playing My Way versus Sid Vicious singing My Way, like that unique product, that unique sound recording product, they were just like, um, yeah, I we, we don't know how to we don't know how to distinguish the rights of the songwriter and the performer and the record label and so forth. So this remained a, an open question and a really difficult um, problem legally and politically. The music industry really wanted to have rights, property rights in their um, recordings that they produced and sold to the masses, but. This didn't really happen until the early 1970s in America. And so this is kind of a story of like them being very frustrated for a long time, but also them being the vanguard of mm -hmm. a new intellectual property rights kind of movement, as I think of it. The recording industry, they were able to advanced this idea that it was really important for the government to protect intellectual property, to protect uh, information that was encoded in a particular way, in this case, in a vinyl record compact set, because we were moving into a, a post-industrial economy that, you know, we don't make stuff anymore. We we make ideas, we make information, mm -hmm. we make software, we make patents, we make soft, like biotech. That's what we do now. So this, the music industry kind of was the vanguard of that idea, which then in the late 70s and into the 80s, other industries like fashion, biotech, etc., began to try to assert mm -hmm. their own rights in the sort of uh, mm -hmm. immaterial products that they produced. Of course, what we've seen in the last years is that music actually has become even more immaterial with the coming up of streaming services and, and of course, the Internet. So that would I mean, I, my next question would be about the fine line between piracy and, and free music. Um, so because we've seen like home recorded mixta mixtapes being distributed for free or, or even like established musicians like Radioheads sharing their, their music for free online or against like a, like, a, like a fee that people can choose themselves. And, and I mean, we all, I include, have streaming scripts, subscriptions for services like Spotify or Deezer or whatever. And, and, and um, they allow us to stream and download unlimited amounts of music for peanuts. I thought I saw 
um, an image, a, a, a number last week about 0 0.004 cents per plate, no, plate song for, for an artist that has, has been paid by Spotify. So, um, so it's often claimed that um, sharing music for free or for a very small fee actually kills income streams for young artists. And, and I would like to know what are your views on this topic, because I know you've written about it. So do you see, see how the streaming economy can actually still generate an income stream for young musicians, provided they want to have an, they want to have an income from, uh, from their uh, art, of course? Uh, and how could we encourage creators and, and especially young and upcoming ones uh, to focus more on maybe creating like a small and sustainable fan base? Um, and how that fan base could be maybe convinced to financial support their creativity? I was wondering if you have any ideas on that, or if you if you uh, if you could share in, uh, any thoughts. I think this is such an interesting question because in the 1960s, when like bootlegging of recordings became like a really big thing, there were people who kind of like postured as being like leftists who were saying we're gonna who were bootlegging like Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, etc we're saying we're bringing music directly to the people we're taking it we go to a concert we take it out of the air and we bring it directly to the people no middleman no uh, record company no retailer and so forth and i don't know some of them were being a little bit disingenuous with that because they were making money off of it but this idea of like free music or free content in general is something that people have been interested in a long time. Like when you think about listening to the radio, it's like, it's just free music. You don't have to pay a subscription. You don't have to, like it just come, if you can literally tune into an electromagnetic spectrum with like the cheapest device in the world, you can hear free music. You listen to ads and stuff, but like you get this sense that something is free. So when Napster came along, there was, this sense that um, now this is the new radio, sort of like this, everything's available all the time. You can hear it for free, you can listen to it for free. That's not how the record industry saw it. They saw it as an existential threat. Now this would have been a really good moment for them to like accommodate themselves to this new like distribution model that like music listeners, fans, they wanted to get music online. That's it. Um, we just like, we're maybe going to the local media play or, um, you know, bank robbers music store um, is not how we want to listen to music anymore. So there was this big epical moment happening around 2000 where Napster presented this idea that music could be universally available to everyone on like a global scale through the internet. And the record industry really did not want that to happen. And so they fought it like hell until eventually they kind of accommodated themselves to it through the idea of streaming. And the streaming economy is an amazing paradise for listeners. For me, like the invention of Spotify is one of the greatest things that's ever existed or happened since probably the invention of agriculture. Like it's I, the fact that uh, someone who's a, as obsessive with music as I am can just like listen to, you know, almost anything and dive into deep catalogs, blow on a swamp or something is awesome. It is the accommodation, it is the compromise of the record industry with the new online environment. And lo and behold, who could have imagined that the um, outcome of that was a situation that was uh, primarily advantageous to the record labels, like Spotify, Pandora, Tidal, etc. They all have like extremely complicated formulas for compensating artists and record labels and songwriters um, for each stream that happens. 
So like you mentioned a moment ago, um, 0.00003 cents for each stream. A lot of people look at that and like, that seems like highway robbery. I think that's a little like a misunderstanding of what it means to like listen to music. When you hear a song on the radio, um, you're not paying for it. There might be a hundred thousand people hearing a song when it's played on the radio and they're not. I mean, the radio station pays a licensing fee to the songwriters um, through ASCAP and BMI and so forth for the right to, to air that, but they're not like literally paying for each of the 67,500 people who heard that song at that one time. So like, I, I want to clarify that that's this, this question of like per stream, like how, how people are paid. Nonetheless, what has happened with streaming is I think a, an extremely good thing for consumers and listeners and fans not a great thing for artists as far as i can tell uh it basically replicates the conflict that had already existed which is that record labels rip off artists and take the lion's share of the proceeds so in that situation i think that the streaming payment model needs to be uh reformed i think that a model more like Bandcamp. Um, or Patreon might be better for artists. Can, can you briefly explain what that model is? For Just sure. For the sake of our listeners, yeah. Yeah, I mean, artists, recording artists, musicians put their music on Bandcamp and they're able to sell it and get like a, a, lar a much larger part of the proceeds mm -hmm. of that like value than in Spotify or Pandora and so forth. It is, it is much more artist oriented I mean, Patreon is a model where fans who are like extremely, you know, invested. I mean, if you like for podcasts, like something that you really, you're like, I really love, I really like this podcast. I want to hear all their episodes. I'll pay $5 a month. Like mm -hmm. I want to hear their premium episodes as well as their free episodes. If there's an artist, like a recording artist, people have deep, like, spiritual connections to the musicians that they love like so they will like potentially pay for what they want to hear or what they want artists to produce so there are these new i mean they're well, i don't know how new they are but like relatively new models like bandcamp or patreon where the whole concept is that fans are directly supporting artists which brings that dream from the like 1960s um bootlegging era of taking music directly to the fans from the air and cutting out the music industry like the record labels essentially um to uh, an actual real thing i think that this is something that could work i i don't know how you implement it on a on, on an, a, a more sweeping scale than than what Patreon or Bandcamp uh, propose at the moment uh, or are able to organize. But I think that this is anything that like reduces the power of like extremely concentrated um, owners of intellectual property, which are basically record labels that take a like a rent like a, a cut out of everything that an artist does anything that can bring like the listeners and the artists together more directly where the recording artist actually gets much more out of it, it would be good so uh, alex you've also written on the blurred lines case um I'm in, and i'm when reading this i'm thinking like this this podcast should actually have a soundtrack you know like we should like be able to play all the songs in the background, <laughs> in the mm, background that we yeah, talk about. But then right. again, I, think, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> so you've written about the Blurred Lines case and, and you state that, um, as is so often the case with copyright, the lines between right and wrong are not are not more clear cut than those between original and un unoriginal. And um, like traditionally, copyright law protects what could be written down on the page, like the lyrics and the melody of the song and, and not like the rhythm or the timbre or the tone or the spirit of a song. And and can you maybe, I think this is very applicable to this song. So could you maybe tell us a bit more about the case? And I don't feel like you hear your personal opinion on it. 
I I feel like it's unfortunate that like the metaphor blurred lines applies to intellectual property <laughs> law and sexual assault. Um, yeah, yeah, of which course. you know, which is what the song is about. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not like speaking on behalf of the song or the record and like label or the artist, but I do think the blurred lines case was pretty um, problematic because it was a big test of this question of like, what's the written song and what's the recording? And then what is piracy or copying or plagiarism in terms of like the song or the recording and so forth? These are pretty subjective things. I mean, like who says uh, this song sounds like that one or this chord per- there aren't that many chord progressions so it's like a g blah, blah like you it's hard to figure that out there are blurred lines <laughs> and in this case um what whatever anyone thinks about this song um the the court decision on this was a little bit difficult because it was based on the fact that it kind of had the same vibe as uh, a Marvin Gaye song. It's like, it's not like the words were the same or even like um, a, a significant part of the melody was the same. I mean, you can't like say, dun, dun. I own that. Like uh, like a larger part of a melody. It was just that, like, it kind of had like the groove of it. Mm-hmm. And as uh, in my knowledge of intellectual property law, um, vibes and grooves have never been... Um, protected because we all need vibes and groups like you need to be able to distribute vibes and groups to the people on a large scale so they can use them to do other things like other songs it it was a bit of a problematic case so um you've highlighted in the past that copyright critics um they aren't like per se anti-copyright but they simply consider that the law became too biased in favor of rights holders um you commented on this tension before, and do you have any opinions on how policymakers should deal with this and, and like both with both sides of this debate? Um, especially because you know, like we see that policymakers in general tend to favor rights holders already in any case. Well, I think there was a moment um, in the early 2010s, at least in the United States, and I think it's probably true in Europe as well to some extent, where there was a a growth of skepticism about this um, just overwhelming sort of um, solicitude to um, intellectual property rights holders, which basically means like Hollywood, Silicon Valley, the people who own Mm -hmm. the intellectual property of songs, software, etc. There was this... um, The SOPA law that happened, that that was proposed in the U.S., and there was, like, a reaction to that. So, like, there was beginning of, like, an opening of saying, like, I don't know, maybe we're, like, giving someone a a copyright for uh, 300 billion years was maybe too much. Maybe 100 billion years, but, like, not 300 billion years. And so I, I feel like there was an opening where people started thinking about that, but... I don't know where we stand now. Honestly, like, I don't think that Hollywood or, I mean, I use Hollywood as a a, a sort of stand-in for just all, like, owners of, like, film, TV, music, etc., like, copyright. Like, the content industry, and then there's the tech industry, like, Google and Apple and so forth. They have different interests. And I... Don't know if I'm, I don't know where American politics is actually aligned. It used to be that like basically lawmakers on the Democratic and Republican side just were kneeling at the, the feet of intellectual property producers, whether they were the music industry or biotech. I'm I think now it's a it's a little bit fuzzy. Like um, they hate, like politicians in America hate big tech, but They also maybe aren't as solicitous toward um, IP industries as they once were. So I don't know where it stands now. 
So you've mentioned SOPA legislation before, and actually, as it happens, my next question is related to that. So maybe I was just wondering, just again, for the sake of our listeners, could you briefly explain SOPA, what, what that was about, like in a couple of sentences? And then I'm I'm just, I mean, we still see the same the same things going on, right? So there's, there's um, the rights holder calling for stricter liability and, and due diligence uh, by intermediary, intermediary services such as platforms. And, and this really, this call has gone, grown stronger and stronger. Um, in Europe, we even see like the imposing of, of upload filters onto platforms. Um, and, and again, like the music industry is quite at the center of that because I think often... Um, it's the music, uh, it's artists that are affected positively, uh, positively or negatively by by that by those filters. And I mean, I'm thinking like a practical example from my own life is like when I recently tried to upload a, a clip to YouTube, um, and you know, like the kid wanted some background music, and I really couldn't. I, I had some difficulties explaining, like, okay, we, uh, I know you love this song. Uh, I mean, he really loves. Uh, um, Nirvana, but you know, like, we, we, can, we really cannot put this in the background because YouTube will just reject it, will not allow you to publish it. So, um, could you maybe um, tell us also how we could avoid new legislation of this type coming up? Like, what kind of activism would be needed in order to to um, yeah to avoid this type of legislation like bubbling up again? Like, it's, it seems to be doing once every every uh, every couple of years, uh, at least especially in Europe, it does. SOPA, or the Stop Online Piracy Act, was proposed in the early 2010s, um, and it would have introduced, like, some pretty, like, draconian, like, penalties for people sharing content online. And it was quite notable, I think, in the sense that there was kind of a furor and... Um, like a, 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 a mess of like noise where people actually like fought against it. Um, so it was like there was a consumer or a citizen revolt against it. Tech companies also didn't really like it. So there, that, there was the beginning of a response to laws like that. At this point, in terms of like um, actual activism or op- opposition to the expansion of these IP rights, um, I'm not sure. I think that like we're in a moment where you have these big sort of um, tech platforms like Amazon, um, Google, Apple, etc., who like are basically what like ABC, CBS, NBC used to be like platforms, broadcasters, distributors, and the content creators. Well, I don't want to say con- content industries because it's a it's a battle between like uh, multiple crooks. I I don't want to say content creators because the the musicians, the authors, like they're not the people who get the benefit of like what these content industries produce. But there is like a political battle between those two sides, and it's not as clear as it used to be. And I I'm not really sure where it's going to go. I think that what we would want is to definitely not expand the property rights of these gigantic corporations. And I, in saying corporations is kind of an exaggeration because that implies that it's like plural or multiple. I'm talking about like four companies mm-hmm. in most industries, music, publishing, etc. Something that like definitely don't expand their rights. Uh, And then, like, think about creating a model that more directly compensates the people who are actually creating the stuff. I don't know. I think this political battle between tech and content is going to unfold over the next 10 years, I in the United States at least. And I think think the EU is also wrestling with this. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the outcome will be. I can't. I'm a historian of predict the future but i think in the meantime we need to like hold the line on like expanding intellectual property rights at at the very minimum and then really try to build models that work for creators Mm -hmm. okay so another thing that we've that we're seeing now is that you know like it's not only 
any more about IP law, IP law or about like the rights of creators and, and but we see that rights holder organizations are actually also targeting uh, like which call it like the internet plumbing <laughs> that helps to deliver the content to us like for example DNS services or CDN services um, I believe that uh, Sony took for example a Swiss DNS operator quite nigh to court in Germany and I was just wondering um, you know, like obviously they took them to court because of they held them responsible for distributing pirated content. So I was wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Because you know, like these are not even the platforms; these are actually the wires and the and the hardware that we that we use to um, to uh, show and play the content. So I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on that uh, and what kind of repercussions that this trend, this alarming trend, could mean for internet users like you and me. I, I'm not particularly familiar with those circumstances but this does seem to be a, a situation where like the platform and the wires and circuits are being kind of like um, kind of misidentified like the platforms are like they're carriers right under the united states law um people i mean companies that provide like um internet service like your you know what, whoever pro provides locally your like mm -hmm. you know internet access um, are somewhat immune to some legal challenges. It's like it it would be like charging um, the 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 city of of Boswell, Massachusetts, for its roads because there was a car accident on it. It's mm -hmm. like you know you like there's some distinction that's made between like who. Um, like the what the actual structures that distribute the things and then what's on them. And so I think there's there's been a movement in the US a little bit. I think Donald Trump unfortunately has had um, quite a bit to do with this to uh, make the people who own the roads like responsible for the content that's on them. Um, and that is very bad. And I hope that it doesn't go anywhere. That's my understanding of the situation. So um, this interview, it will appear on a blog called World Culture. And, um, you know, as, as you know, we are interviewing lots of different stakeholders and uh, creators and, and uh, uh, academics and uh, activists uh, about different issues uh, related to, to copyright. And we, a question we ask everybody is actually like, do, can you tell us maybe a bit about a personal experience where you actually hit the copyright wall? And thought like, okay, there's something wrong here. Something's not right. This should be different. I would be very curious to hear about your experiences. Well, I mean, I I, I don't want to be overly like precocious, but this this hit me kind of early because um, our family was like very poor and like in a not a good economic position. <laughs> and my mom like worked her ass off to like provide any opportunities to me that were possible. So we had like a, a, a set of like uh, encyclopedias and <laughs> we only got to about uh, volume D. <laughs> like, so they, they used to be alphabetically, like there's A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I don't think we were able to afford beyond that. And so like, I think about that all the time. Like I could have like, um converted to a different religion if i had been able to get like the 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 k or the um s volumes of that encyclopedia but we didn't have it i think that really like very early influenced me it's like information is scarce and it's mm -hmm. expensive i mean i grew up in a little bit different time so like you know information was scarce like the internet was not a thing that most people knew about when I was growing up, but it was still this sense that like, why am I held off from this? Why is this uh, put behind a wall? Why is this put in a box that I can't break into because I don't have the economic resources to do it? I spent so much time at the uh, public library in Gastonia, North Carolina, or at Gaston College. I was fortunate enough to live across the street from Gaston College. So I was able to go to their library and like read the nation or read mm -hmm. just any periodicals 
that really like opened my mind. I was like, well, why is, why is this, why is there so much effort in keeping people from this? And that's not an argument against like the writers or musicians being compensated at all. It's just a question of like, why are people like me sort of held off from experiencing this? I feel like there, there's also like, like in the nineties, like I, I was a huge Prince fan and when he had his whole battle with his record label, he like wrote slave on his face. Mm-hmm. And like they, the problem with that situation is that Prince wanted to put out 5 million songs every year and the record label didn't want to do that. Like they want to do their model where we do 12 songs in a CD. We do three singles. We maximize our profit and they help him in a legal contract. And it's like, well, yeah, it would be a better world if like Prince put out more music. So like, why, why is, why is this happening? This, all these things kind of like percolated into like me thinking about, um, I don't know, in, in that early 2000s moment, a little idealistically about like what's possible. Like we could have a different way of doing things where everyone gets to like uh know things and hear things and see things and i I mean also and like where you know artists and writers and other creators are not like completely ripped off at the same time i think i think we've talked by now a lot about what's wrong and and with copyright regulations in the music industry it's maybe it all comes down to the fact that it's not suited for the digital age at all if it was ever suited for any age uh, before um but I would like to ask you, um, maybe as a sort of real closing question, like how can we how can we make this work? How can we make this work in an online and connected world? What what are the the things, the main things that need to change for you? Uh, and how can we try to make those changes happen? Um, in short, maybe summarizing the question: What should 2030 look like to you in an in a like an optimistic scenario? Is there an optimistic scenario for 2030? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, Maybe 2080 or so. Or maybe, maybe it will be even worse than that. Uh, I just that's saw, just for the sake of argument. <laughs> I just saw the documentary Dune, um, which was filmed in 2080 and um, was sent through time travel to now. Uh, <laughs> not a good picture. How would I um, imagine that? I mean, I think like one of the things I like ticks that I feel very kind of like vexed by is that people say, oh, why are we using an 18th century like uh, system for the 21st century? Like, why are we using 18th century or 19th century copyright law for the 21st Mm -hmm. century? It's like, well, that's extremely not accurate because um, the first, I mean, like, if you if you wrote a book in 1803, you would have like 14 years of copyright in the mm-hmm. United States. I mean, I'm not sure I would say 14 years is the right amount of time, but it would be a much more open and liberal system back then than it is now. Um, in 1908 or 1935 or 1960 even. So the system we have is a late 20th century um, model. Mm-hmm. So I would, I just, this idea that it's antiquated and people don't understand, like it is antiquated in the sense it's antiquated to 1999 when like the Mickey Mouse Protection Act was passed that Mm -hmm. just like arbitrarily added on 20 years to like copyright for no reason other than like Mickey Mouse was about to go out of copyright. So we just passed laws for the express interest of enriching and securing and protecting vested interests. Like, of the the incumbents the establishment so looking forward like you know um nine or ten years i would hope that is this like an idealistic question or is this a a like like in in a perfect world kind of question or is this like a like what could actually happen question <laughs> it depends a bit on on the on your your, your take on that you could do both actually i'm 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 not really an idealist so like i'd say um maybe a realistic image would be nice but 
I also like to hear people dream. It um, can be inspirational. <laughs> I mean, like I said earlier, I would absolutely support a, a ban on any further expansions of the length of copyright or the penalties for infringement. This has been out of control since the 1970s of just like, we're going to throw you in jail um, because you like, like tried to like rewire your John Deere tractor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a terrible way to do things. Um, I think this, the, the guy, Aaron Schwartz, I think, I, I think that yeah. is who it was, um, you know, killed himself because he was going to federal prison for just like making academic journal articles available to people. The, this has to stop. So like a total moratorium on expansions of any property rights for giant corporations. That means um, academic publishers, record industry, Hollywood, and so forth. I would love to see the length of copyright rolled back quite a bit in a perfect world. You know, I think back in 1975, when the length of copyright was 56 years from the date of publication, um, was a pretty good standard. Um, maybe even less than, I don't know, but it was like at least reasonable. Now it's the life of the author plus 70 years, I think. Seven. In um, Europe at least. Uh, yeah. In the U S I think as well. Yeah. Um, or, and then, like, if it's a corporation, it's a different amount of time. But, like, basically, you will never see something come into the public domain that was produced in your lifetime. Like, this, that, I would love to see that rolled back. Uh, I would love to see net neutrality actually supported in the U.S. Um, that is still a live issue. Um, I, would, I would really, I'd be interested in looking at Twitter, Facebook, and so forth or Google as um, common carriers, which means um, the same way that like a TV network or a radio network is treated as um, they own the public airwaves. So they have some like um, dutiful responsibility to the public. Uh, they're treated differently. Like they're, they're, um, they're subject to more rules and in the new internet economy, like all these things are like the new broadcasting network, but they're not treated the same way. So um, I don't know what that would look like, but I would be very interested in seeing um, a different perspective brought to how we think about what these gigantic networks that like control such a vast amount of value and influence our lives in such an like extensive way, uh, if they were treated as being, Things that use the public property, or what would it look like if they were treated that way? Something, something to look forward to, <laughs> or not? <laughs> I mean, that okay. could go in a bad way. Yeah. It could go in the way of like censorship. I mean, if the government gets too heavily involved, it could like have a pernicious influence in suppressing speech on different platforms. That could be a problem. But I really do think that, like, in my lifetime, there's been a uh, a little, little tiny bit of a movement toward thinking about, at least in the United States, thinking about um, concentrated economic power and monopoly, which had completely fallen out of the discourse in the late 20th century. Um, in the progressive era of the 1900s 19 teens like people were really thinking about like monopolies like u.s steel like um like the u.s um furry bear corporation um they control all furry bear production in the whole country and mm -hmm. like we need to curb that because it's bad for consumers it's bad for like business businesses that want to compete with them it's bad for everybody and that whole like discussion fell out of the mix at, at some point in the mid to late 20th century in the United States. I do see that creeping back in. And I really think that there's a possibility that um, we like actually uh, treat these things as the monopolies that they are and think about what they mean for um, the consumer other businesses, 
the government, just like the health of life on this planet, uh, you know, I think that would be a very good direction for us to go in. And I do think that we're like kind of getting there. The whole debate about net neutrality kind of mm-hmm. is a part of that. And there's a little bit more of an anti-monopoly sentiment uh, now than I think there's ever been in the time that I've been alive on this planet. So, Alex, thank you very much. I think this was a very interesting and enlightening, and um, especially for me as well, because I'm not I'm not that versed in the in the music industry and what's happening there. So, it was. Uh, I hope the listeners also will find this very, very interesting. Um, is there anything before we before we go? Is there anything you'd like to share uh, as a closing remark uh, or any issue that you think? Oh, we should have discussed this during during this podcast, or it's not complete. People in the U.S., in Europe, um, and, you know, certain other parts of the, like, highly developed affluent, like, world or industrialized countries or however you want to put it, have been subjected to the idea that there is this conflict between, um, like, fans and artists, consumers and producers. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I think that the 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 utopian ideas of like what the internet could be in the 1990s have been you know like pretty uh besmirched by um google and apple and facebook and other you know predators that have you know taken something that people once had these like amazing ideals of like what it could be and have made it into something that is that feels predatory and also have told us that like uh, fans are like music listeners are like uh, greedy little assholes who like don't want to pay artists. And I'm like this gigantic um, music rights owning corporation that is global. And I'm fighting on the behalf of artists. This is fucking bullshit. I think everybody knows it's bullshit on some level, but they've been able to obfuscate things enough. I think if we re like rethought that and kind of understood that like people who love music, people who love literature, um, they want to support it. They're not terrible people. They know that other people need to make a living. Um, and like maybe like get rid of these people who are like, um, profiteering and oh not get rid of them that, that sounds awful <laughs> but like cut out the um the part of the process that seems to be skimming everything off um and making life difficult for consumers listeners readers fans and musicians artists writers and so forth um i think we could do that and i, I do feel like there's a little bit of a, a there's kind of a, a a feeling for that right now which i think is awesome So we're ending in an optimistic note after all. <laughs> an idealistic note after all. So Alex, thank you. Thank you very much for all these very useful insights. I found it fascinating. Uh, it, it gave me like a little bit more uh, background on, on an, uh, an industry that I'm not necessarily that well uh, that well versed in. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, it was lovely talking to you. For the listeners, please stay tuned um, for other episodes in this uh, in this podcast series.